Well, good morning, Miss JJ. Good morning, Natalie. How are you today? I am swimming right along. <laughs> swimming. That's fantastic. Oh, you know, like when you're swimming around, like people are like an arm floaties on, like when you're not making them, like my arm floaties are like half mast. Oh, okay. So something yeah. like a life jacket, but not quite. Yeah. But arm floaties because they're fun. Oh, that's true. It's better. Anyway, it's better. Yeah. You know what? You know, today is a great day. Number it is one, a great day. It's number one. It's my anniversary. And you and remembered. I, and I remembered. Yes. And I I couldn't think of a better thing to do on my anniversary than to have our guest today. <laughs> and when you said good morning, it is really good really morning good for morning. her. Yes. Because it is, uh, it's probably about 5.45 a.m. Um, for her. So really she is... She is very fresh and she was brave to come on and be with us that early. So, and we're the <laughs> so, best in the morning. I know. So let me tell you about her, you know, okay, so she perfect. can get to talk because that's really important as a guest. It does seem you know? like she should talk. Uh, okay. So here goes. So today we have celebrity. How's that? You're a celebrity, a celebrity, Amy. Celebrity. Uh, <laughs> we have Amy Bouchatz with us today. She is a reporter for the Anchorage Daily News and the founder of the Matt Sue, I probably messed that up, Sentinel, a nonprofit startup newsroom in Alaska. She is the host and producer of the Humans Outside podcast, sharing what she loves being outside and running. But what in the world took her to Alaska? That was the question I had Ooh, because I don't think she's thing. from Alaska. I don't think so either. Um, it was, of course, caregiving. Mm -hmm. Her husband, Luke, sustained a TBI PTSD during his 2009 deployment as an Army Airborne Ranger, though it would take years to understand its impact on Luke and their family. So in 2016, Amy, Luke, and their two sons, Huck and David, mm -hmm. moved to Alaska, sight unseen, to help Luke find healing. Amy says that that process in that process, they found healing for everybody. And Amy, we are so glad to have you here. We said we feel like we know Amy because she is actually, her family is featured in the 2023 film by Richard Louis, um, Unconditional. So we oh, feel like so we know you, good. Amy. Thank you for being here with us. Amy's like, well, sister. thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, it is bright and early here in Alaska, but you're lucky because I am a morning person. Do not try to talk to me after 8 p.m. And God forbid you try to make me go somewhere after seven o'clock at night. It is not <laughs> happening. That is nighttime. We're not going. I support that. Is that an Alaska uh, thing or just a you thing? No, that's a me thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's big time okay so in the winter time this is probably going way off track in the winter time when it's dark when it gets dark so early that is sort of an everyone thing like things don't go as late at night in the summertime when it can be light really like deep twilight all night long like it doesn't actually get dark although the sun does set people are out at midnight going on hikes they're like living their best life and even though i am a morning person and you will not catch me trying to go somewhere at seven o'clock i have been known to go places at seven o'clock at night mm -hmm. on purpose in the summertime and or look at my walk or think like oh we should make dinner and realize it's you know eight o'clock so oh, wow <laughs> because really it's so light your mode it is yeah so, <laughs> so crazy we went on, so we went on a cruise and so basically you didn't know we were like right next to you i don't really know where you live because i just feel like alaska and we went to alaska on a cruise so we clearly were near each other and um <laughs> and i can remember sitting on the cruise ship we love you norwegian love them um we were on the cruise ship and we're just sitting there and we'd gone to a show and we were sitting there and cause all you do is eat. Like you just, it's like you plan for your two hour breakfast. You sit there until, Oh, it's almost time for lunch. And you just kind of graze. I feel like I feel it's like a little that. bit like going to my mother's mother-in-law's house. Continue. Oh Fantastic. God, yes. <laughs> and so it was like one night I was like, I kind of feel tired. And I was like, Holy crap. But I'm like, why am I tired? There's still light outside. It was 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, because it's bedtime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, it's time to go to sleep this house. Because on the East Coast, it was four hours behind. And I'm like, I'm over here slowly dying. And so <laughs> anyway, thank you for Alaska. But we're not here to talk about Alaska, although I really do want to. Um, we're here to talk about your caregiver journey and your experience as a caregiver and and kind of how that started. And, and JJ always jokes that I like to say, you know, start from the beginning. You were born and then skip to the care part. So tell us about you and Luke and how you got married, you know, all kind of that background piece of it, like give us the juicy mm -hmm. part and then like, and then what happened? 
That's funny because when I go on very long adventures with fairly new friends, I'm I well, first of all, I have like I need to breathe and such. And really that requires me not talking. So I say to them, So tell me about your life. Start with when you were born. Yeah. <laughs> no, we were friends. And it gets to, it gets to know people really well because then you know all about their background and things that you would not know if you did not ask ever ask them that question. It's great. Anyway, okay. So um I am from California, from Santa Cruz, California, which is the opposite of Alaska, by that the way. Is the opposite. True. <laughs> and my husband is from the like farm country in Ohio, which is also the opposite of California. So you can see we're just sort of going down opposite lanes. Mm. I would like the minutes to reflect he does look corn fed. He does, right? Okay. He looks like a chicken farmer, does he not? Like a man who <laughs> likes to hold a chicken. I, I didn't, I thought more of a, maybe a baby goat, but I can go yeah. chickens. Keep yeah. going. <laughs> okay. So he was in fact chicken King. That's an unofficial title. It was like a 4-H farm program, oh. King of the chickens, like chief chicken. Ch- you know what? I don't know the words, but I call him chicken King. It works out. So yeah, there are like a lot of blue ribbons and a bag somewhere that I'm like, why do we have these? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> So we were both homeschooled and we met through the homeschool program, which had sort of a, like a college-esque program. Yeah. Um, that is an entirely separate and dramatic story. But, so we're okay. not going to tell that story today. We only have 49 to 52 minutes. Only have those hear minutes. Later. Yeah. So we met in that program. He joined the army. I moved away to Washington, D.C., where I was working as a news reporter. And then he had a very close friend who, through school, who was also my close friend, Mm-hmm. there in Washington, D.C. And we reconnected as friends with that guy mm-hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. And here we are. OK, so <laughs> that was in 2008. You fell um, in love. It's supposed to be. It was a fairy tale. You lost it was a, a fairy shoe. tale. He's, the army. Yeah. Okay. He's doing his army thing. You're in D.C. being like queen yeah. of mm-hmm. all the words. Mm-hmm. And how, so how long did you guys date before you got married? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes! she said nothing was off balance she's she like no, okay really. so i convinced him that he really did want to be in a relationship with me oh. in august of 2007 okay right. yes okay and we i moved to washington state in december of in like christmas of 2007 uh-huh. because i was like long distance relationships are ridiculous also you have to like think about this was like the peak internet dating era and i was like i really don't want to do that i want to know someone in person before Mm -hmm. i marry them and we were not friends in college like we knew each other but i thought he was extremely annoying and so (laughs) i love that That yeah so i even remember like there were 30 people 33 people in my program i remember specifically thinking if i never talk to this guy again that's fine (laughs) And then you procreated. That's weird, right? I love it. Keep going. God was like, ha. Watch this. Okay. So so I moved out to Washington State to be in proximity in December of 2007. And then we got married in June of 2008. I love that. I love that. I that was an excellent question, Natalie. Good question. Good question. (laughs) Okay. And we had our first son in April of 2009 because he was in the military and we knew he was going to deploy. And there's something weird that happens to your brain when someone's going to deploy, which is I should immediately have a small child to take care of while this person is gone. I don't know. It's it's crazy. People do this. It's not just me. It has no no basis in logic whatsoever. Um. Except to say that there's also a thought in the back of your head, whether you want to say it or not, that if this person doesn't come home, you have a replacement oh, in the form of a it's child. You know what? Yeah. yeah. The truth. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's again, it makes it's not super logical because like if your husband was to deploy and didn't come home, would you really want a small child that you now have to raise and yeah. be tied to i mean just being quite frank for the rest of your life because this person is now gone and now you can't fully move on ever because you have their child is that really what you want anyway like i said logic has it's just an emotional decision logic has no basis no reality okay so uh yeah so we that's how we met that's how we got married and our first son was born in 2009 he deployed six weeks after our son was born Mm mm-hmm 
five weeks. And then um, was in what in the military we call a very kinetic deployment, which is words for lots of stuff happened and many people got hurt um, and died. And then he was sent home in end of December of 2009, again, around just actually Christmas Day, to um, take over the uh, unit that so the unit was still deployed there's a position called the rear detachment commander and that person mm-hmm. is kind of in charge of the wounded people or anyone who stayed home mm-hmm. or helping work through casualty stuff with the wives and the widows and the families okay it's mm-hmm. a very high pressure job because yeah. you want to be you, you know you trained to be overseas and now you're not and when you take over that position halfway through a long deployment, such as was the thing that people did at that time, I'm not sure this is really done quite as much anymore because deployments aren't typically a year or right. 15 months. They're much shorter. Um, because of that, he ended up taking over this position and really being the point person with all of the wives and moms and kiddos of people who had died at this point, over 20 men in his unit had died for the people who had died in his presence or with him on that deployment. So if you can imagine having someone literally die in your arms and then coming home and now you have to work with his mom and his wife and his son and you know, this was a obviously very emotionally high pressured environment, but because he had also been injured during this deployment, he had received, been concussed multiple times. Thus, he has a traumatic brain injury. Mm-hmm. He was in a very high, you know, like if you a recipe for post traumatic stress, right? Oh, like yeah, let's no. you know mix and shake, and now you have it. Okay, so he was in that, and then he came immediately home and was not did not have an opportunity because that's the environment we were in to even address the fact that he was injured, much less process any of this. And so after everybody else came back in 2010 from that deployment, we were moved by the military to the next thing. And again, we didn't really have the time or bandwidth to process that. He was in a school environment and it was supposed to be a situation where you can. And I remember the commander at that at that school saying, this is a chance to take a knee. But I think the knee that we took was really at, as we were burying our problems in, a dir- in the dirt. Like, <laughs> let's just kneel down here and just chuck some dirt over these so we don't have to look at them. But yeah. also... Not even that intentional. We just simply did not have the tools to understand what was happening or process it or talk about it or understand that it might have happened. I mean, any of those things. And so we were at Fort Benning, Georgia, which is now called Fort Moore. They just changed the name. Right. And uh just not dealing with stuff and not even knowing that we had stuff to deal with, frankly, because I'm a, I don't know if you can tell this guys, but I'm like a pretty aggressive person. And so I just when there's, to get it done. <laughs> yeah. Like if, if there's something to do, let's do it. Right. Let's talk about it. Let's take care of it. And I've become more like that over time, I think probably because of this journey, but I didn't even recognize that there was something to take care of. And I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm not sure he did either. So we went through that and then we moved to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, because after you're done with that school, about eight months of that, they send you to the next place. Mm -hmm. And Fort Campbell, Kentucky is not, shall we say, known for being relaxed. (laughs) It's a very high um, operation tempo spot. Mm -hmm. So the guys and women deploy a lot. They are in constant rotations, especially at that time in 2010, going overseas, going to Afghanistan, going to Iraq over and over and over again. And so it's the home of the 101st Airborne. If you remember the um, show or story of Band of Brothers Mm -hmm. deploying to Europe, that is the unit. That's their unit. He was in their unit. And so they have this high pressure environment with lots of deployments, plus like this lineage that they think they have to like live up to. And so he was immediately in units that did not have the space to talk about that or did not give the time to talk about that. And did not give the training calendar to even go get appointments. If you felt like you were having a hard time, there was no space to say, I need to take a beat and figure this out because that's not the environment. That's, that's, I mean, you're serving in the army. We have stuff to do. Okay. And so he 
began to understand and I began to understand that there was something off, but I didn't have the words to understand what it was. So what that looked like was he would forget stuff. You know, he would go to work and he had a bag of like workout gear that he would like set on the back of his car and then drive away. (laughs) And he lost, I kid you not, two bags of stuff this way with his wallet in it. Um, at least oh once gosh. where, you know, he like this expensive PT gear and this expensive bag and his uniform. It's all just gone because he stuck it on the back. So, you know, you could make this mistake. Anyone can make this mistake. Let's not talk about how many times I have lost or put my phone on the back of my car. Well, yeah. th- just the one time where it flew off the back that taught me never to do that again. But I have definitely driven around with it back there before. And OK, so this happens like this can happen to ever- anyone. Right. Yeah. But for him, it was a symptomatic pattern of forgetfulness then he started to have chest pain and i begging him to go to the emergency room because he was he he was 29 29 i was like okay he's young yeah Yeah. so he's like he's so tired from mowing the lawn on the riding lawnmower that he has to lay on the couch for three hours Mm. and i'm like i don't really think this is a good sign you know and he just like categorically would not go to the emergency room so literally a week before the deployment that they were supposed to go on he finally has an appointment with the cardiologist on base now we had been at a party with the entire unit at the boss's house and we were sitting around a bonfire and the brigade doctor was there so this is the doctor in charge of the doctors in the brigade all of the other people under him are not actually doctors they're physicians assistants or medics they're qualified but they're also processing a lot of people and so when luke had said i have my chest hurts you know they're like is it after you eat a lot of food knucklehead and he was like you know yeah also that and so they prescribed him heartburn medication right for his chest pain okay so we're sitting there with the brigade doctor and i'm telling him like hey luke's got this chest pain and they prescribed him trilosec and he won't go to the emergency room and I'm starting to get a little emotional. I like have this memory of seeing this guy's face and this like in the firelight and and like realizing that he was concerned. And so within a couple of days, Luke's butt was <laughs> at the at the army hospital getting an EKG, which was not normal. And then yeah. the next week he was at with me at a cardiology center in Nashville. So outside of the army hospital system, getting a catheter to see what the, what was going on up there. And uh, that was the, that catheter was uh, the week before deployment. And what it found was he had major blockages in his arteries, which, oh, by the way, we now know can be, studies show that heart conditions, stuff like that can be tied to traumatic brain injury. There are, Mm. there are ties between those two things symptomatically. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Wow. And um, the next week, like I am sitting in the waiting room watching footage of his unit getting put on airplanes to deploy. And he is in surgery getting stints in his heart and being put on blood thinners overnight in the ICU, just like you do after you have major heart surgery like that, you know? And so he did not get to deploy. And this really triggered a total meltdown because he was really holding himself together to deploy. And when he didn't get to do that, he completely spiraled out of control. He was um, pursuing addictive behavior, you know, so he was drinking, he was having an affair, he was just out there trying to self-medicate in any way that he possibly could, and in the process, becoming suicidal and really, like, destroying our relationship and our family. And I'm back here, like, totally clueless. You know, I can see this person is struggling, but they say they're fine. You know, we go to church on Sunday, so it must be fine. And you have this sense that something is off and can't put your finger on it. And then so about a year later, it all fell apart because I found emails and I was like, what's going on? And he became even more suicidal and he became even more lying. And we just had to figure out how to recover, like if you can even recover from that. And so 
that looks like a year of pursuing band-aids, right? Going to 12-step meetings and getting counseling and really having to journey to a point that is when they say rock bottom, there you are, you know? There's really no way to describe that other than when you get there, you know it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, And it for him, it looked like a moment where I'm almost like very out of body experience. I'm standing in our bedroom and I am looking at this guy sitting on the floor of my room, literally in a ball crying and telling me he, he doesn't say I'm now getting emotional again. He doesn't know why he came back. He doesn't know why he's alive. And, and I realized this guy is, this guy is suicidal. Like I never would have thought that, but he definitely was in that moment. And so I did the thing caregivers do right? Like I said, okay, we're going to deal with this now. And so I called a couple of our close friends from church who had been his accountability partners, apparently not very consistent or not very effective ones up to that point, um, and asked them to come over and get him because he needed to not be in my house for the sake of me. And (laughs) because I also needed to take care of myself, which is something I learned in the 12 step program uh, over that year to have boundaries and how to do that. And so they came over, they, I also gave them his weapons, get these out of my house. We had a shotgun, nothing, you know, we didn't have any handguns or anything like that, but whatever we had, I gave them to them and asked them to lock them up and put them far away for a while. And they took him out. He had been, I think at that point he had been drinking. So they took him out to, uh, you know, sober up too. And, <laughs> and uh, he stayed with a friend for about a week and a half, maybe a couple weeks, um, would come over during the day to see our kids. Um, and I made an ultimatum really, but let's call that a boundary, right? They're the same. They're the same thing. Mm-hmm. And my boundary was, you're going to get help, whatever that looks like, or I'm going to leave. We're out. I'm moving back to Washington State, which I really liked with the kids. You know, we'll have a plan. And he decided that the help he needed was not going to be something that he was able to get while staying in the active duty army. Mm -hmm. And so that was in 20, this was in 2015. And we made a decision that we would spend the next year working to get out and making a plan of what he was going to do next um, and help, help him get help. And I said, if, he would respect my boundary of never, ever, ever, ever doing, you know, um, cheating on me essentially again, (laughs) that I would, uh, stay unless I just decided to change my mind. And then I would go like, you know, that's my boundary. I get to change my mind. So to change my mind, Amy, during all this time, because I want to make sure, like, I know like what Luke's going through, but you, like I hear, and I see you, you know, with the tears in your eyes, I see that and you've set your boundaries, but you also have, you now have two boys that you're mm-hmm. responsible for. You're working, you were an editor for mm-hmm. a, a large magazine, a military magazine. What, what is going on with you? Like, where is your, like, where are you? Yeah. So I really was, I was running and I was doing CrossFit and I was really using those two physical movements mm-hmm. to work through this. Um it was hard, right? I felt, I I mean, I was betrayed. I felt betrayed. I was confused about why this was happening to me, but I also understood that I was able to come to a place that where I understood that this is a symptom of an injury, not a symptom of who my husband is as a, as a person. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, it was, I was in therapy quite a lot, right? I, refused to go to therapy with him anymore at that point because that had just been him sitting there lying to me for a year what a waste of time right i hate it when people waste my time i i knew that i could leave if i wanted to and but i decided that i've got two kids over here who if if their dad is healthy right if he is at a place where he is pursuing health and pursuing treatment and working on it they deserve to have a dad who's doing that. And I could handle working through it. And so that is why I decided to stay because I wanted them to have the opportunity to be with their dad. But I also wanted me to have the opportunity to heal because I come from a family that is just a hot mess, hot mess express. You know, so many people who are in relationships with addicts come from relationships where they were, you know, either they've been in one before or their family modeled that. Right. And my family modeled that. 
And so of course I was in relationship with somebody who was likely to do that. And if I wasn't going to work on myself and fix my own problems, it was just going to wash, rinse, repeat. We, I don't have time for that. So (laughs) I I gotta break some chains over here, you know? So I was, I was really pursuing healing for myself. Now, I, you know, if you've watched the documentary or you're talking to me right now, you can see I'm a pretty intense kind of person. Um, I have a very strong personality. I know that I am not for everyone. I'm okay with that now. Uh, but yeah, but I've gotten okay with that, right? Like it was, we didn't wake up one day like, oh, it's okay if people hate me. No, like this was a journey to be like, I'm good with being a strong personality. But I will tell you right now, it's gosh, being a strong personality helps with caregiving. Because yeah. I know I can set my boundary and stick with it and I can power through stuff and then go talk to my therapist about it. Actually, I have an appointment with her tomorrow. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love pretty therapy. Stoked. I love therapy because it's all about me. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like having a, be- it's like having a very close friend who, and you never talk about her. It's great. No, no. It didn't even matter what her name is. She's, I was like, Hey, Hey, bestie. Yeah. <laughs> you won't believe what happened. And so, right. and, and, and they hold, and you know what, here's the thing, cause we're huge advocates for counseling and people are going to say, and, and, you know, and we've talked about this, I've talked about this with another friend. It's like most caregivers say, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. And if you don't make time, then, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of like, if you don't heal from what happened to you in the past, you're going to bleed all over everybody. Right. And right. So if you don't make time for yourself. You're going to have a real problem. And and also let's be honest, it's expensive. Therapy is expensive. Get having access to that is a is a matter of privilege. There is there are free programs. So if you are a U.S. based um, military disabled veteran spouse, okay, in the United States, you can register for the Soldiers Angels Women of Valor program, and they provide free access to MD Live, where you can receive free mental health care via telehealth. Wow. Now, telehealth, free mental health care, not everyone's jam. I like it. Uh, or rather, I I like mental health care. I don't love telehealth. I like to be in person. But if that was the option I had, I would use it. Yeah. So that is a resource. And there are other resources like that. The Wounded Warrior Project oh, provides yeah. mental mm-hmm. health care to veterans. Yeah. So there are many, many options specific to the veteran caregiver community Mm -hmm. you just have to know where to look you also have to want to you have to want to find them you have to create that bandwidth because just like you're saying if you're not willing to create the space you can't you're like time is a vacuum it will be used like it will just dissipate so you have to figure out how to carve out some for yourself and i know that you can you can you have to do it though it's not going to magically be done. And that is true if you are taking care of many people at the same time and have an incredibly packed life. And it is true if you're taking care of one guy who's pretty self-sufficient. I talked to two caregivers yesterday, um, very different ladies, uh, different situations. Both of them had just gone to this retreat program that I was talking to them about for a story I was writing. One of them has a spouse, a lot like mine, who, by the way, is doing really well now and is completely self-sufficient in almost every way until he's not. And then you're there to provide care. That's what we do, right? So for him, that can look like um, he actually has a chronic headaches and migraines. And so I have to pay attention to if he has a headache today, how are we going to deal with that? And I have to pay enough attention to see the signs that he has a headache which can look like being irritable or it can look like, gosh, I just can't remember anything today. Like there are days that he's like, I, like he cannot remember people's names at all. Um, Still is great at his military job, by the way, he's still in the national guard here, but the, the little things on the side and that are not a part of your everyday pattern, he has trouble with. Then there are days he's great. And he's like, he doesn't need me at all. You know, and I'm like a sayonara sucker and I go on a trip or something and he holds it all together. Okay. That's my journey. One of these ladies I talked to yesterday, same thing, right? Her husband is very similar to that. She helps him remember to take his medication. That's really the most of the care, consistent care he does. She does. The next lady I talked to has six kids at home, four of which are not her biological children, their nieces and nephews. All of the children are extremely high need. 
And she takes care of her mother, who has had 14 heart surgeries in the last two years. And her husband is very, um, very disabled. Okay. Both of these people found a way to go to this overnight retreat for a few days in Colorado. Okay. Mm-hmm. It is hard <laughs> to get away, no matter who you are. And it is reasonably harder for some people than others. It can be done. And we are talking, when we talk about therapy or going to the gym, which is my other type of therapy, or going for a run, we are talking about an hour and a half. You know, let's let's use 15 minutes buffer to get there and back. Okay. We're talking about an hour and a half of your time, one day a week, uh, several days a week to take care of yourself and 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 invest in yourself so that you can turn around and do that investing in others. Because I'll tell you right now, if you don't take care of you, it's all going to fall apart. And we know that. We say it all the time. But it is so hard to act against it. America is the land of the free because of the brave. Norwegian Cruise Line never takes that for granted and is proud to support our troops with a discount program for members of the U.S. military veterans, reservists, and their spouses. Service members get 10% off their cruise fare, where they'll be met with exclusive onboard experiences as a token of appreciation. NCL's Military Appreciation Program was created for veterans by veterans. Learn more about their military discount and program at ncl.com slash military. That's ncl.com slash military military. So Amy, you guys, you, I love this. You sight unseen, you said Alaska and, but now when I watched unconditional, like I see just what you said, there are days when you care. And even I noticed your boys saw that, that Luke was at, in that video, like dad has a headache or, mm-hmm. um, but You went to Alaska. Tell me about caregiving now, what that looks for you, but what has getting away from it all and changing your life done? Yeah. So when we made the decision to move here, first of all, I was like, there is no way in hell that I can stay at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Get me out of here. Yeah. Like the the place, the like the nature, the the location itself, great. People Mm -hmm. love Clarksville, Tennessee. It is so Mm -hmm. beautiful there. Awesome. Couldn't stay there. Not with the, not with the, the, I just like, I personally needed to leave. And yeah. so we knew we weren't going to stay there. And we decided we would pick somewhere that jived with who we were, but also what we wanted to prioritize. And so given the opportunity to move anywhere, my job was mobile. We decided international wasn't going to work out because my job is mobile, but I also have time zone concerns. And that really we could try Alaska because we had really loved Washington state and Mm -hmm. Alaska is like Washington state plus. Okay. Make this like, it's like on steroids, right? (laughs) So all of the nature you liked about Washington state, we have that, we have less traffic. Yes. It's colder. There are other, you know, there's other stuff there, but if you like the vibe, you'll like it here. Mm -hmm. So we moved up here sight unseen. And when we did that, we found the, You know, people say, oh, I'm going to move away and everything will be better. Well, that's not true because your problems follow you, right? But there is something to be said for a dramatic reset where you are forced to start over and re-examine yourself as long as you know that you also have to, that your problems will follow you and you're still going to have to address those. And so coming up here gave us the space to have that like actual physical reset and start over in many, many ways. But it also helped us reprioritize what's important to us. And for Luke, I knew that spending time outside helped him and have that space to heal. And what I found when we got here is that the same was true for me, although I did not anticipate that. And so in 2016, we moved here. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like living his best life. I had much more challenge in the moment, I didn't know that I was having a challenge with the change. Looking back, I can see that that was true. And so in May of the following year, I, I it was almost like I woke up a little bit over the wintertime, like, okay, I'm feeling better now, like ready to have a party. And it was cold in Alaska and there was no party. <laughs> I've since learned you can make your own party in the wintertime. I just did not know that. So in May of that year, I was like, okay, Alaska, let's do this thing. Let's have some summertime. And there was this day it was just pouring rain and I was like, what the, like, like <laughs> what is happening here? Like, why am I wearing a sweatshirt and a hat? And where is the sunshine? And I realized that I was going to have to change me 
to be here that I couldn't just keep on, you know, doing my Netflix and gym thing and think that I was going to get out of Alaska what I thought I was going to get out of it by just magically appearing here. And so I set out to kind of create a new habit going outside, which is the set now the subject of this podcast I have, Humans mm-hmm. Outside. And I, since that point, have been going outside for at least 20 consecutive minutes every single day, no matter the weather, and doing that for my own health and caregiving mm-hmm. journey, but also to discover what are the benefits of that. Cause I'm a journalist and that's what I do. I investigate stuff. Um, and so I'm at like something like 2,225 days in a row of going outside every single day. I've gone outside in windstorms with like gusts at a hundred. I've gone outside on incredibly gorgeous days. I've done so many countless new things because of this. I am outside in the winter time where your nose hairs are freezing. I am outside running. <laughs> I go to a running group on the in the winter time on Monday evenings that they run if it, it doesn't matter what's happening. Okay, so. 60 mile an hour winds with free sand blasting to your face, like my, you know, low cost microdermabrasion. I'm out there. Um, <laughs> you know, like That's uh, awesome. best day of your life, like the most gorgeous morning you can imagine. I'm out there um, watching the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights from my hot tub. I am there. Okay. I'm there no matter what is happening. And that practice that self-care practice really is what that is, has fundamentally changed how I see the world because of all the benefits that you find from heading, spending time in a space that allows you to reconnect with your own self, which is really what nature does. I totally agree with that. It, it really, I will say when we went to Alaska and being outside, it was it's different than East coast, West coast, whatever, being in the mountains. I believe we grew up in the uh, Smoky mountains in Tennessee. And so we were outside Knoxville. You were in Clarksville. We just, mm-hmm. we don't know anything yeah. past Knoxville. Cause that's where UT's at. And so we're like, is there anything past there besides some shopping? And so I get it. And, you know, I think that's so important because it's also definitely quiet. Yeah. Like you can hear yourself. And for people who aren't comfortable enough, to get quiet, to really mm-hmm. hear, that is getting uh, uncomfortable. That's I, you really know, I think I think Alaska forces that, but I would I think that you can find that anywhere, and and I know that because I've found that in other places. Mm-hmm. You might have to look a little harder. You can find that experience of being outside and taking that beat in nature in Central Park in New York City. A hundred percent. You know, like it is, it is not, don't, I don't want people to hear me and think, oh, I'm not in Alaska. I can't do that because I'm really strongly believe that nature is wherever you are. And it is a matter of intention and focus. It's not, yes, absolutely. Alaska creates lots of spots to do that for sure. Some places, rural places are more like that than others, but you can find that literally anywhere, literally anywhere. Yeah, I think you have to, I think you're right. I think you have to look for it. Cause I can tell you whether it was walking in Central Park last year or we would go over to um, this park off 57th and it was the, it was the the most perfect place. It's one of my favorite places to go to in New York city. And it's this teeny tiny little park off 57th that looks over the water to Roosevelt Island. And, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's really, I think it's really good advice. So I I do want to say, um, and this is different because I think this is important. Well, you, you have people who have caregiving journeys that end and typically Mm -hmm. the end is Mm -hmm. it ends when somebody passes. Yeah. And so we've been caregiving and we don't even realize it. And I didn't even think about this, but I mean, I didn't even see myself as a caregiver for Jason until he got cancer, not when he became disabled. Mm -hmm. And so I've been taking care of him, you know, I've been taking, I'm his wife, but I really was a caregiver for him since when he was disabled in 2015 and never saw myself as that. And that's one of the biggest problems that caregivers don't see themselves as caregivers. They don't see the dual role that they're playing, but you have, you, you're in it for the long haul. I don't know that your care ever ends. I think it feels like intermittent care. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's every day, but, um, right. but, uh, you know, I, I, I agree. Like the end will be the end, mm-hmm. the end. Uh, um, 
I maybe this is a coping mechanism, but and I've and I've told my husband this that I'm always prepared for that. I feel like I'm prepared for that because of his heart condition, you know, which is, I mean, he has these stents and he's still, he's doing great. And his cardiologist says he's fine. But that guy also told me, you know, the army doctor told me that Luke was one of his patients that he expected to get a phone call someday that he just dropped dead Mm. and like on a run or something. Right. Because it was such a strange, the fact that he was 29 and had this and was otherwise, you know, it's strapping young man. Right. And so, I, in a lot of ways, have thought, I mean, I've thought about that. Like, what would that look like? Um, I'm not sure how comfortable my husband is that I've thought about that. Yeah. Um, that I have a plan, but I'm a planner, right? And so that makes me feel better that I've thought about that. Um, you know, I, I think that's just kind of reality of caregiving in a lot of ways is that is that you do think about that. Um, as far as intermittent goes, he has challenges every day, you know? And And here's the other thing, guys. When I think about it as being intermittent, I get off my game. And so then I'm surprised by something that is like, oh yeah, okay, well that's a TBI thing. And I don't know why I didn't see that coming. Well, it's because I let down my guard and I was off (laughs) my game for a day. And so I'll give you an example. We have this, you know, this strapping young man of mine. We have this uh, (laughs) husband of mine, we have this patio area that he really wanted to fix. And he's like, I'm going to put pavers onto this patio. I want to flatten it and put pavers on it. So he had these guys who were constructing a deck for us, flatten this sucker. Okay, fine. He's like, I'm going to put pavers on it. Sure. Now you (laughs) and I and everyone else in the land know what pavers look like. Okay. It's like a, I don't even need to describe it. We know what it is. He did not know what it is. And so, (laughs) and so I go outside. He's like, I'm done. I'm like, come see it. And I come outside and he literally has um, like stepping stones. So paver pieces, like as stepping stones into the middle of this dirt area, literally leading to nothing. It's just dirt and like six stones into the middle. Okay. And I was like, I did not handle it well, guys. I did not keep it That's okay. (laughs) I I was surprised. Okay. And I was like, what? So I was like, this is what? You're done? And he got really mad at me it's like if you had wanted something specific you should have told me ah ah tbi okay because he struggles with understanding the steps to do tasks that are not things that he's familiar with so like it's this it's this getting from point a to point c and all the points in between and he just sort of wanders around if he doesn't know the specific steps so that was really an important lesson that that was something that we knew he struggled with, but had never had quite a dramatic an example. And now when it's time to do something that is ambiguous like that, yeah. we talk about it and we I'm um, go step by step. And it's not, it sounds like babysitting when I say that, but really it's a partnership where I'm like, okay, so what are you, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to cut this down. Okay. Well, what's the point of that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm working on this project. Okay. So, um, do you know how to cut it down? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how to use a saw? Yeah. And, you know, and the thing is, <laughs> have is, we Googled is, that? <laughs> yeah, Jason watches a lot of YouTube. Um, so, and that's great and because YouTube is our tool. You know, yeah. so here's the thing: like, we have the tools, we have the technology, we have the apps, we have the calendars, we have the YouTube. We just have to use them. Mm-hmm. And when I fall off my game, I forget about all those things. Forget about them all. Mm. I think it's, that's, that's part of caregiving though, too, is that you're accommodating your, your, you're constantly learning and adjusting. You're adjusting to the person's needs. And if you think about it, you adjust, um, while trying to maintain yourself and keep yourself balanced. Like, it's interesting. If you think about it, you're constantly moving yet trying to stay balanced. Yeah. Yeah. That's what Mm -hmm. caregiving is. I'm trying to stay, my equilibrium is I'm trying to keep, my little nervous system happy and stable so that right. I can move up and down with them. Yeah. And that's hard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think I do a lot of thinking about somatic, uh, which is n- nervous system, um, somatic experience. I, because of my podcast, I've had the opportunity to talk to just all sorts of experts. Right. Mm-hmm. So one of these people, her name's Sarah Histan. She's a mental health and foreign physical t- trainer. And she talks about nervous system stuff and thinking about that really has helped me quite a lot because now I understand my fight or flight mode, which is just 
flight, by the way, like, get me out of here. Yeah. And I understand what I do when I'm under pressure. And a lot of that is because I spend so much time outside. So Sarah has helped me put words to this, but I know how I react in extreme pressure moments because I'm outside experiencing them. And then that translates to coming inside where I can be like, okay, I can see that I am sort of hoarding my time or because when I'm under stress, I hoard stuff. Okay. So I live in a scarcity mindset. So I can see that I'm acting in a scarcity mindset here in, in my inside life with my spouse, with my kids. Um, it looks like hoarding my time. I don't have time for that. Don't talk to me right now. I'm busy. There's a difference between I'm in flow and I'm trying to write this thing and Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't deal with you today. Like, (laughs) These are not the same thing. So I start hoarding, when I'm under stress, I start hoarding my time. When I'm under stress outside, I start hoarding my snacks. I'm like, oh, we can't eat this right now. We might need it later, even though I have like uh, so many snacks. Um, Or my the clothing. Like I shouldn't put this, I'm cold, but I can't put this on right now because I might be more cold later. This makes no sense. Don't do that. Okay. I know that I do that because I've done it. Right. And saw the repercussions of that. And now I can bring that inside and understand how I'm reacting and how my nervous system reacts and keep it in balance, hopefully. I mean, none of this, like we talk a big talk here, y'all, but this is not there. Nobody's perfect. You know, we're figuring this out every single day. These are the things I've learned. And if I implemented them every single day, I'd be really good at this, but I don't. (laughs) But it's just about learning. It's just about knowing yourself more. And that's all of our goals as caregiver. Like Mm -hmm. I have to know what my own triggers are and where my weak spots are and, and what, you know, like you said, you saw Luke when, you know, you should have noticed that TBI, that was an issue, but I just need to know, you know, Hey, when I'm really snippy or I'm like, wait, I'm tired. Like, wait, I need to step out and take care of myself for 20 minutes or do the outside walk or or do something like that. So yeah, well, and and we talk about stuff, right? And this is one of the things we talk about in in that film, because I come from a family that did not, does not talk about stuff, period, end of story. Doesn't know how, hasn't learned, isn't going to learn. Okay. Yeah. However, We work hard in my house here to talk about stuff. I literally say to my kids pretty often, well, we talk about stuff. And this is an example of that. And so that's big things and that's little things. And so that means when mom is, you know, me, when I'm getting a little angry, my 14 year old has the ability to say, hey, mom, do you need a snack? He's not being rude or, um, you know, uh, disrespectful he's helping me. And yes, Mm -hmm. actually I do need a snack. Thank you. Or when I say to him, you know what? I'm hungry. I need a snack. He can be like, okay, that's where we are now. Like (laughs) we've been among us. Yeah. Who among us has not been hangry? Right. Exactly. So he knows that my kids know like, and, and oh, by the way, they know for them too. When I say, okay, I can see that you're really upset right now. Um, can we take care of this after you eat something? Like they have, they don't get angry. Like it's really easy to have someone say that and just get more angry. Like, what do you mean? I'm hungry. Of course I am. Stop being annoying. Okay. Uh, they have the presence now because we've worked on it together to say, yes, I would. I know I will feel better after I eat something. And yes, we can pause to take care of this. And that's true in every single thing that we deal with, right? There are lots and lots of examples of things like that, that mm-hmm. we can then talk about because we make the practice of talking about them and work on yeah. it every day. Yeah. Wow. Man. Like Amy took us to church today, Jay. I know we go to church a lot when we get these guests on. I feel like I've had therapy. Like Like, actually when we're done, Amy, I'm going to go outside and get my sunshine. I like it. I like like what you say. Yeah. Like what you've said is that I, I hoard my time. Sometimes I feel like I need to stay in and get stuff done. And I don't, I don't go outside. I I think I I feel like I'm going to keep you updated. Like Amy, I went outside today. Amy, I'm on day 10. And when I get to day 2000, I'm coming to Alaska. I'm like, here I am, Amy. I'm on day 2000. 2001 with you. (laughs) Nice. <laughs> All right. So do it. I, I think that's actually fantastic, but you know, it's now Jay, I'm ready. We're, we're at that place. Mm, we got sister questions and okay, ready. we're a little late into sister questions. So I'll hurry. Do your sister question. Okay. Mine is always the best. Oh, whatever. Um, okay. Amy. So caregiving, I know that you are, you're in the long haul because uh, Luke's is not something that's just going to go away. Um, But, you know, regardless of lifespan or anything, because we always say mortality is at a hundred percent, but he could live to be 80. So you guys are in this and you're in it for the the long haul. Um, 
you care for Luke, but you all are married. How does Luke care for you? Like, what does it do for your, what is, what is your marriage? Good question. Yeah, he he understands that I am a high energy person and and understands how to give me the space and care that I need. You know, sometimes the, the often that look, you know, not to make it sound like I eat all the time, but often that looks like making me food. You know, um, he's like really good cook. Food uh, is love. <laughs> and so I say to him, like even last night, I was like, um, so do you think you could cook me that chicken please and he does such a better job cooking chicken than i do i mean it yeah. is like he's the chicken king okay it yeah. goes the whole distance <laughs> so he <laughs> so it looks like giving me space and then taking care of me yeah um and a lot of that is me having to communicate what i need because he's not a mind reader and right. i think the tbi sort of keeps him from guessing I mean, it would be great if he was a mind reader because then things would just materialize, but that's not how it is. He also gives me space. So when I say I need to go on a run, he knows that we don't run with husbands. Mm-mm, no. Mm. And I will inv- sometimes invite him and then he's invited, he's allowed into that space. But mm-hmm. otherwise that is a space for me to have me my moments. Sometimes my moments look like with a best friend where we're talking about things. She also does not run with husbands, by the way. She's not a caregiver. She just, th- this is a rule. And so- <laughs> like it <laughs> yeah so he gives me that space um yeah. and he takes care of me that way yeah i love that i like it i, like it. I, I like that because the thing is is that it sounds you guys care for each other and jason yeah. and i care for each other um lime um shrimp tacos mm. mm-hmm Amen. I don't, I don't make a single meal. And even though Jason has no taste, everything tastes really bad. Somehow he still is able to cook and everything tastes spectacular. And it is the insult to him. Yet it, I know that I don't feel bad about eating in front of him because even though it tastes awful, he, it brings him joy when I sit there and I just gush and gush and gush and gush. And he takes mm-hmm. care of me because I need yeah. to take care of just as much as I want to take care of him. Some yep. days I don't want to take care of him. Some days I want to cut him. And so, right. well, and you know, <laughs> that's, but that's, I call that marriage. Um, yeah. and so, all right. So here's my question. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. What? I feel like I know it, but I don't. What is your favorite guilty pleasure? The thing that you do only for you. I have this cup of coffee in my hand. And- yes. <laughs> So this particular cup of coffee has the tiniest little bit of eggnog flavored creamer, which I don't usually allow until after Thanksgiving, but they had it at the grocery store and I broke early. Okay. (laughs) Cause I love eggnog, but I love coffee and it's, it's, I've never laughed so hard watching something as the moment in this documentary where Richard so beautifully captured my relationship with my coffee maker and it felt to me like minutes long, I'm sure it's not, where he shows me making coffee and then cuddling my coffee and then taking this long, luxurious sip of my coffee. I just really like it. I drink extremely <laughs> weak, typically black coffee in very high volumes. But it is like, ev- guys, it is like a sacred, I don't know if this is early morning, Amy talking. It's like a sacred little time for me. Every time, like every, like holding a mug that's the perfect size for my hands, how warm it feels. In Alaska, that's important. I'm cold. You know, I'm wearing like a long sleeve shirt and a puffy vest right now in a closet. Okay. Um, when you're really cold, if you hold your coffee to your sternum, it like warms up your whole body. It's delightful. Uh, coffee next to campfire, mm, guys. Coffee with friends in a coffee shop, yes. It's it's a portal almost. It's not about the caffeine because again, it's. Ex- I mean, that I need that too. But it's. I'm drinking extremely weak coffee. Okay, sometimes I put it on a number one setting, one of eight, and then water it down. Okay, it's about the warmth and the almost ceremony if you will, of having this moment where I'm doing something that I just really enjoy and um, just have that moment for me where I'm like, I am drinking this coffee. Yes. (laughs) You know, the eggnog creamer idea, I do like that. So that's only seasonal. So I'll toss that in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. You'll appreciate this. I'm sorry for all the guys. I don't know if I'm about to start, but I'm going to tell you, I feel very tearful about you talking about your coffee because it's like... (laughs) I'm sitting there and I'm like, it's, 
it's the warmth that's the regulating that it does for you. It is what yeah. it symbolizes to you. Mm-hmm. And it's your space and it's sacred to you. It makes me think of our friend Candace Straw, who, and you need to uh, friend her on Facebook or LinkedIn, but Facebook actually, because Candace puts a meme out about her love of coffee every day. Mm. I'm going to send it to you because Candace, we love you. She's in Chicago and she has this unbelievable love of coffee and the memes are so funny. It will align with you and it will just make you, you'll be like, she is my person. Mm. (laughs) She is my person. So we love you, Candace too. Amy, thank you so much. Like, I really want you to be your bestie. Know that Virginia is for lovers and you're always welcome in Virginia. Thank you, (laughs) ma'am. And um, JJ has a house in the Keys, so you should visit there. Yeah, yes, ma'am. And at some point I'm coming to visit in Alaska because I want to hang out and be, I just, I like, you know, the outside idea. Let's do it. You're great. I think you're a great human being and I love you and thank you I for love sharing. your story and we love that. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's it's so much fun to get to talk about this with people who know. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Guys, until we confess again, thanks so much. 